The Holy Gospel for this, East, this fourth Sunday of Easter comes to us from the 10th chapter of St. John. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So today within our sermon is that we take a look at Psalm 23 and John chapter 10. So grace and peace be unto you from God our Father, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today I want to go ahead and I want to talk about the bad news, the good news, and God's good purposes that he has for us in these texts. And so where do you guys want to start? The bad news or the good news? We'll go ahead and start with the bad news, if that's all right. We'll, we'll get it out of the way. So what is the bad news? So you'll notice the very verse that we put there with this bullet point. The Lord is my shepherd. I know what you might be thinking. I thought that was good news, Pastor. Pastor. That I thought that was something good, that was something comforting, is that I've always seen this as a beautiful and wonderful imagery of this very care and provision of our God. See, the fact is, is that it needs to be bad news before it is good news. For the very fact that when I stop and I reflect upon these verses today, that there's something that strikes me. That if I were to go ahead and compare myself to an animal, that there are many animals that I might choose to go ahead and hope that people would compare me to. As powerful as a bear, as majestic as a lion, as graceful as a gazelle. If you've ever seen me dance, you know that is not true. <laughs> is that as very fast as a cheetah or indeed as ferocious as a tiger, I can get behind those imageries and illustrations. I don't know if I can quite get so behind. Pastor Ebert's just about as powerful as a sheep. Is that, Pastor, you're just about roughly as intimidating as a lamb is that, Pastor, you're about as directionally you know, focused as a lost sheep. Usually I make it there of wherever I'm driving to. Sometimes it just takes a little bit more. So, Pastor Eber, you're about as smart as a flock of sheep. Oh, man, thanks, guys. Wait a minute, I, I don't think that's a compliment there. See, what are we getting at? The fact is, is that while we so often hear this as a beautiful and absolutely wonderful image, and it is, the fact is, is that first we must understand and recognize the very news means that we ourselves are sheep, that we are those who find themselves in that very place. I mean, how would you like it if someone went ahead and came up to you and said that you were slow, not very intelligent, stubborn, stiff-necked, and you lacked so much common sense that not only today, but almost every day, you are going to get yourself in trouble. <laughs> that you are not going to be able to make it on your own out there in life. 
how would you like someone to come up and say that to you? (laughs) Because King David just did. (laughs) The very fact is is that when we look at sheep in the midst of the animal world, the fact is, is that they are those who find themselves utterly in need. That there are no very natural defenses in the midst. That there are no claws, there are no fangs, there is nothing that they have. They don't even have quills or a stink to simply, well, they sometimes stink, but not so bad as a skunk to simply ward off the others. They have no natural defenses. That they are not fast, they are not nimble, they are not gracious. That they need the very watching over of another. The fact is, is that not only that, but they can be stubborn little critters that know their own way even though they do not. That if only I had a group of those who thought that they knew everything, that they were so stiff-necked and so stubborn to go on no matter how many people want to tell them how life should be. That luckily enough, next service is that I have our confirmation service and I have a group of junior high confirmands that just might fit that bill. (laughs) But the fact is that it's not just youth that sometimes stiff-necked and stubbornly continue on their path, ignoring everything around. And we too can be those who find themselves defiant and reckless is that there in the midst of things, that what is it that David now says? That we are dependent, that we are those that by our own strength, by our own very means, that we cannot make it on our own. But yet in this life, what do we so often see? A struggle that we go through and see in the lives of others or ourselves. That as age happens and as aging becomes a part of a reality, we fight and we refuse to give up our independence because we are those who know what we're doing. See, David comes first with a bit of bad news. That very fact that we cannot make it on our own, but he indeed invites us to turn in confession, to turn in trust to Him who is the very one who cares for us. See, first off, we must admit of who we are so that we can truly see Him for who He is. And that's that good news, that when we admit who we are, that we can come to see Him for who He is. And what does David say? That he is the one who does everything. That he is competent. That he is capable. That he is the one who indeed sees us through. That as he makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And we know how it goes on. That there even in the valley of the shadow of death, there he is with us, that He cares for us, comforts us, loves us, leads us, guides us. He is the one who is beside us through it all. The question I ask you today, that when you think about Psalm 23 and the picture that David paints for us, is there anything missing here? Is there anything that we could ask for that is not beautifully painted? That God is with us in the good and the bad, that He is comforting us and caring for us. He is providing for our physical needs, our emotional needs, our spiritual and our psychological needs. He is with us through it all. He leads us. He guides us. He directs us through it all. Is there anything that could be added to this very psalm of thanksgiving. That that is what we see David pouring out here, a thanksgiving song as he comes before his God in prayer, thanking him for all that he has been given. That over these past weeks we've reflected upon that very call within our prayer life to first adore him for who he is, 
and then to confess our very need of Him, and then to see all of those ways that He is now at work in our lives as we thank Him for everything that He has done, that He is with us through it all. That is there anything that could be added or improved upon to what David adds here? Jesus thought so. That Psalm 23 proclaims to us that our Lord is our shepherd, that He is capable and He is competent to care for us. But Jesus goes on to say this in John chapter 10 that I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The David proclaimed God's competency. Jesus now proclaims his very commitment to us. His very commitment that He is not just one who is capable of handling our problems, but He is so committed to even go to His death that we may be saved. That Jesus now proclaims the very fact of all that is there. That God now comes into our midst and now in Christ Jesus offers Himself so that we may be saved. That because He died that we might live that because He goes before us, that we can faithfully follow after Him. See, today we see the very imagery of the difference between the Eastern and the Western world. Is that not just in the very things that are there, but the very images of the shepherd. That when we see the very difference between the Eastern approach of shepherding and the very Western approach of shepherding, we see the very thing of what it is that Jesus Christ offers here. Are there any out there that know the difference between the Eastern and the Western approach to shepherding? Any shepherds out there? No? See, the Western approach is with the shepherd in the back with the dogs and everything else, and they are pushing and they are driving and they are leading those very sheep as they are now pushing them forward. But what is the Eastern way of shepherding? It's the shepherd in the back driving and cajoling and poking and prodding and simply trying to get these stubborn little critters where they need to go. But the imagery is the shepherd out front who is graciously calling and inviting that by the very sound of his voice, by the very word that he offers, is now indeed leading the sheep forward. That how many times do we find ourselves in the lives of others around us having that very Western approach? That we are driving and we are wanting and we are trying to push them to make the right decisions or do the right things or even ourselves, that we find ourselves always driving for something more. That Jesus does not come with a word of menace and a word of heartache and a word of hardship, is that no, indeed, He is the one who now invites and calls for us to follow after Him. That He is the one who is out front, the one who has taken His cross and now led the very path that is before us, and He simply invites us to follow. That as we join that very flock, As we as a part are now gathered into His very fold in this place, we celebrate that the Lord is not just my shepherd, but that He is our shepherd, our good shepherd who laid down His life. But the fact is is that there's not only just bad news and good news, it's that there's also God's good purposes at work here. See, Jesus indeed invites and brings these shepherds in, and we celebrate that we are a part of those who have now been gathered here. But there's something else that Jesus adds. That do you notice, that, if we could have our next slide there, as that His good purposes, that I have other sheep 
that are not of this fold, that I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock and one shepherd. That what is his purpose? His purpose is indeed not just that we can celebrate that we're here in the fold, yay! No. We can celebrate that God has brought us in. But the fact is, it's the very imagery that Jesus gives is that very fact that there are those that are not part of this flock, not part of this fold, that he desperately desires to bring in. That Jesus is talking about that very mission of his church, to bring others into this very place. And so we celebrate that God has given us this very promise and given us this blessing. But the question is, are we those that are willing outside of this place to be identified as those sheep that He has called us to be? Those that live a different life. Those who are seen as offering something that is different than this world can offer. Offering of a love that Christ has given to us offering us of a mercy and a peace, not that we are driving and cajoling, but inviting and bringing. See, too often I think that we see a fear out there, but the Lord, our shepherd, is there with us out there as well. See, I think of those instances in my life that that kind of is that place. But I think of one particular instance a number of years ago, is that back when I lived in Nebraska, my daughters were about three or three and a half years old, is that we came back home to northwest Indiana to visit my parents. And while we were there, we went up to Lincoln Park Zoo in downtown Chicago. And there we were in the midst of things, is that we've been enjoying a wonderful week, and my daughters were teaching my parents the prayer that they had been learning in preschool that, week, you know, that time frame is that it was the shark prayer. I don't know if you guys know the shark prayer. The shark prayer goes like this. It's that you get your fin up, and then it goes something along this line. God is good, and God is great, and we thank Him for our food. Amen. See, a nice simple prayer, right? And so when we were there in the midst of the Lincoln Park Zoo, and we sat down for lunch in the midst of the packed you know, uh, food court, And we sat down and we asked, girls, what prayer do you want to say today? And they said, the shark prayer. He said, my my dad had been doing pretty well all week long on the shark prayer. But when out there in public, his fin got a little bit lower that day. (laughs) I've seen that in many other places. I'm not saying that you should go out in public and do the shark prayer, especially not alone. People will look at you differently. (laughs) But the fact is, are we only comfortable when we are in our private lives? That Christ has led us not just in the good but also the bad. Not just in the green pastures and beside the still waters, but there in the valley of the shadow of death. He leads us not just here, but out there then may we live as those who admit that we need a shepherd. Let us live as those who know that our shepherd has given himself for us. And may we live as those who live within that good purpose of those who confess our faith undyingly and committedly to those around us. And so may God grant you that very peace that surpasses all understanding, that guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.